Hi, everybody. I'm Frank Lieber, and welcome to Madison Square Garden's Felt Forum for a truly historic event in women's sports, the first World Women's Judo Championship. 27 nations on hand competing in eight different weight classifications, and working with me is Rusty Kanakogi herself, a former coach of the U.S. women's team and an organizer of this event, and I know this is a proud and happy moment for you. It certainly is, and we're very delighted to have you here cover our event, and it's a history being made, the beginning of the advanced movement towards the Olympics for women's judo. Hello to our judo family joining us from all around the world for what promises to be an exciting online session. My name is Lisa Allen and I'm the head of the IGF Gender Equity Commission. I will start by outlining the format of today's session, but before I begin, I would like to say that we have French, Spanish and Italian translations for those who need it. And you should log in with the Zoom for the translation. For English, there's no need to log in you can just watch the live stream in English. And a huge thank you to our three translators today, Marine, Sarah and Monia. These ladies are volunteers, not professional translators, and we thank them for giving up their time to help us. I also want to say an enormous thank you to the people who have worked hard on their part to realize this project. Elisabetta, Nico, Pedro, Matthias, Ziad, Mari, Christiana, and the media team at the IGF. And to Keith, Devon and Cecil from USA Judo, and mostly to Mr. Kanakogi, Jean and Carrie from Project Rusty. We will start with a welcome from the IGF and the Kanakogi family. We will follow up with the participants telling us about themselves, and then we will have a fun question and answer session. It will be relaxed and informal, so sit back, relax and enjoy. We now start with the welcome from the IGF president, Mr. Marius Wieser. Family, on the occasion of the 40th anniversary, dear judo family, on the occasion of the 40th anniversary of the first woman world championship that took place in New York in 1980, I would like to congratulate and express my gratitude to the women in our judo family, as well as those who have contributed to promoting, encouraging, and sharing our passion for judo and its values. Today, we take a moment to celebrate this meaningful and inspiring event for judo, sport, and society. Today, judo is celebrated as a model of equality and equity between men and women. I'm proud to say that next year the participation code at the Tokyo Olympic game will be exactly 50 for men and 50 for women. But the road here has not been easy. And this world championship paved the way for many generations of inspiring athletes to come. I thank all of you for your boundless dedication, hard work and enthusiasm. Happy anniversary. Thank you very much, Mr. Wieser. And now we will have a welcome from the Kanakogi family, without whom the first Women's World Judo Championships would not have taken place. Ladies and gentlemen, Jean Kanakogi. Good morning or good evening, wherever you are, everybody. Uh, 
That's Sorry, Jean, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> go good, ahead. Good, mor good morning, everybody. I'm Jean Kanakogi, and I grew up in the shadows of Rusty, uh, not only as her daughter, but as her student and, and her trainee in life and in judo. Uh, what she gave me were the tools to fight for equality and the foresight to lead and open doors for others, as she did in 1980. I want to say a heartfelt thank you to the IJF and the Gender Equity Commission uh, and all involved for getting the judo world together during this difficult time. This journey today embraces the triumphs of the past and also celebrates the progress for the future. Uh, this all started because Rusty was really ticked off. In 1959, there was no women's judo competitors or, or no competition in 1959 in the US or formal. And so she was entered in to fight and she disguised herself as a man. Uh, she had short hair, she was tall and, and, and thin and um, nobody knew the difference. And she went into this competition in 1959 and she won, she beat a man. Well, they found out she was a woman and they took her medal away from her just because she was a woman. And from that moment on, she decided that this was the turning point. This will never happen again, not on her watch. And no woman should ever suffer such an indignity ever again. So she decided she's going to get women's judo in the Olympics. She didn't know how. Uh, she came up with an idea. We need to have a world championships. They, everybody said you need a world championships before you can have women's judo even considered as an Olympic sport. Well, she said, fine, I'll hold a world championship. She finally got approval, uh, but they said, well, where are you going to have it? And she said, well, you know what? I'll have it at Madison Square Garden. Well, she spoke, the words came out of her mouth and $146 was in her bank account. She didn't know how she was going to pull it off, but with determination and, and guts and grit, she pulled it off in the biggest city in New York City in Madison Square Garden to kick off the first Women's World Judo Championships. This was pulled together by her dojo, by volunteers, uh, and she ended up getting uh, near over 25 countries, I, I think 125 competitors at this first Worlds. And this was the stepping stone to the Olympics. Uh, recently, we finished Get Up and Fight, which is her book. It's the memoir of Rusty Kanakogi. Uh, this book is told, the story is told in her words, in her voice. So reading the book, uh, you will hear her voice if you knew, knew her even for a second, and you'll hear her voice and her rustyisms in your head. Uh, we have a website, rustykanakogi.com, where you can find it. Uh, and also, if you ever come to New York, uh, a street in Brooklyn, Coney Island, is co-named Rena Rusty Kanakogi Way. I'd like to introduce my father and give everybody a heartfelt welcome to this weekend's events from my family. So thank you so much for being here, you're all trailblazers, for attending uh, the event and, and opening the way for others behind you. Dad, you're next. My name is Leohe Kanakogi, and my wife is a... Rusty Kanokogi. And uh, I want to say the congratulations, the 40 years anniversary to the first World Women Judo Championship. The 40 years is uh, like a sound like a long time ago, but the time is uh, uh, I feeling like uh, yesterday. So uh, anyway, this program IGF doing is really I appreciate it. And also the prayer that I remember. Like yesterday, the, the prayers is I remember the, like in 20, so that means uh, around uh, like almost 40, no, not 40, it's 60 years, 60 years old. It's a brief or not. So anyway, congratulations. <laughs> and uh, Good luck for the all. Thank you, Mr. Kanakogi and Jean. So now everyone has an idea of what it took to get this event off the ground and what an amazing determined visionary that Rusty was. More importantly, this was the start of Olympic judo, being not only for men, but also for women. Rusty never quit, even when she couldn't get the International Olympic Committee to add it to the Los Angeles Olympic Games. She got up and she fought. And after another four years of constant lobbying, writing, promoting, it was included as a demonstration in Seoul 1988, and then included as a full sport for women in 1992 in Barcelona. 
and it's remained on the Olympic programme since then. So please let us all remember Rusty Kanakogi and be grateful for what she did, not only for women, but also for judo. So as you know, today, it's actually 40 years since the first day of competition of the World Championships for Women. And the aim of this project is to commemorate both the pioneering women who participated in the competition, along with all of the other people involved in the event, the coaches, the team officials, the local volunteers, the organizers, the referees, and to remember those athletes and judo, judo family members who are no longer with us. And also to examine how much women's performance judo has progressed in the intervening 40 years and to see where we're going to go in the future. Many beautiful and touching articles have been published on the IGF website, thanks to Nicola and the IGF media team. And Elisabetta has lovingly collected, cropped and uploaded more than 300 images to the online gallery of the competition, including the hand-drawn venue plan, which looks exactly like the ones we use today for the World Judo Tour, except ours is digital. So the idea for this project came when the Italian women were celebrating a 70th birthday of a very special woman and world champion, Margarita de Cal, who was a panelist yesterday, along with all the other amazing participants. So we're going to start today with the panel and I'm going to ask our first panelist to tell us what she's been doing in the last 40 years. Ingrid, would you unmute your microphone and share with us your story of the last years? Um. I'm very happy to be there and I can still remember like it was yesterday, I came to New York for the first time. I was a very shy girl at that moment, maybe nobody believes me, but it was. And then coming, I came from a very small place and then I went to New York to this big city. I can always remember the big, uh, big buildings, everything was like, and then uh, with Rusty who met every judo player. I think she was the organizer. She knew everybody. She went to everybody. She did the commentating. She did everything what you can imagine. But I think at the moment when we were there, we didn't really realize what we were doing. It's only now after years we realize what we did and what she did. Rusty was this American woman with a lot of noise, big, big, <laughs> always talking and always moving. So the, she gave us that much energy. What happened in New York, I was not, um, I had um, two silver medals at the same year at the Europeans and Belgium decided not to put me in my right uh, weight category under 72 kilos. So I had to fight over 72 kilos. And I decided at first not to go to the to New York, to the World Championships. But when I came home and I thought, well, New York, maybe I'll never go to New York again. And so I decided at the last moment to still participate. So I participated in the over 72 kilos. And then uh, on Saturday evening, the team came to me and asked me if I would do the open category. But the open categories was, I love the open category. That's what, what I really like to do. And that's where I got my gold medal. So uh, I didn't, I didn't uh, realize it at the moment, but uh, I had a really good competition. And that's where my life started. I mean, everything, everything after New York was different. I came back to Belgium. I had a big um, welcome party. I had, uh, everybody was on the, on, the, on the airport. I had a lot of journalists coming up because uh, at that time, uh, normally in the, in the papers, there was only football. And there was, uh, it was snowing, there was no football and the journalist, it was for two or three weeks, there was no football and they had to, to write things. So we don't realize, and yesterday nobody told us, but they told it, but in 1980, not all the women did, did sports. And even judo was something like nobody, not many fathers, they didn't want the girls to do judo. When we talk to women judo now, it's like normal. It wasn't normal in 1980. So that's all already, we did a different sports. We did sports, we did something uh, very, very good. And it was like, a, normally they said it was only for men. So it was a completely different period. Also the, the videos that they said Jean found, the first time Rusty showed me my, my final, it was like years after she went, I don't know, we went into a room, we went, uh, uh, 
uh, to a radio station or television station, and she showed me the the first time my 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 final. So uh, afterwards, I decided to quit school and um, to quit the school, and I had to be a cleaning woman to get money to try to do uh, some more judo and to go to uh, training. In Belgium, there was not that much training, so. Uh, Roy Ingman, we didn't talk about him, but Greta will build do probably. He was the one uh, who made me come to England a few years later to train and to get better. So the picture behind Loretta is really, really nice because, uh, because uh, that's all the girls I went. They, they were staying in a house. They were, they were training like, like nuts. I mean, uh, I never saw people <laughs> train that hard. And I'm very, very happy I, I, could, I could join in to that competition. Thank you very much, Ingrid. That was lovely. And we'll, we'll ask you more questions later on. So we're going to jump across to Germany now. And I'm going to ask Karen Kruger to unmute. And she can tell us a bit about what she's been doing in the last 40 years. Hello. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Rusty Kanikogi for her endurance and insistence. Um, what ended up in having the first world championships as a milestone for the Olympics. And also thanks to Jean and her dad and Carrie and all the staff who made it possible uh, this event to, to have this event for us. Yes, my, for me, uh, the first worlds have been a waypoint uh, for greater goals because I uh, I lifted up my goals to, uh, I wanted to compete at the first Olympics as well, after the first Worlds. And um, yes, besides working, we traveled around uh, with our national team. Uh, in Germany, we had lots of training and later on together with a man. And, uh, yes, and around, yes, in 90, I won the second, uh, second gold medal after 12 years since I won my first gold medal at the Europeans and Rusty wrote me a postcard, a celebration card, which will read in, it's not easy to be the greatest, but you sure make it look that way. That was how Rusty always wore. Um, yes, and to, uh, I fought up to 92 and I finished with a bronze medal at the Europeans. I stopped competing, haven't been picked for the Olympics and Yes, in 93, I retired from individual playing and 95 from competing in a team. And 90, after the European Championships, I graduated as a physiotherapist because I didn't want to end up in an office in a reinsurance company between papers and dust and everything. I wanted to do something with people. That's what I've decided during my judo career and I had to finish it during my judo career because otherwise I wouldn't have had any money. So I did it then. And 95, I opened up my own physiotherapist uh, practice in Konstanz. That's when I stopped, um, stopped uh, supporting our youth national team as a physio. And I started uh, giving a class, a judo class for younger people in uh, the city hometown, yes, in the hometown judo club. And uh, started, uh, yes, I started um, competing in a team, a, a physio team, supporting track and fields youth in Baden-Württemberg up to the Germans. And that's what I still do. And I still give a class for gymnastics for runners. Yeah, and otherwise I'm following judo all the way. Uh, on these IGF videos, which you tape from every competition, this uh, live videos. That's where I follow judo up to now. And yes, my sports has changed after I uh, retired in judo. I did some climbing, inline skating, bike riding, surfing, diving in Australia, and um, still left is sailing, uh, skiing, and golfing. So I have no cyber joints now, <laughs> up to now. So it's still working. And what I never will miss is uh, traveling around the world and meeting judo friends, former with the judo team later on, on my own. I still, I visited uh, judo friends in Australia 
as well. Yeah, and yes, been Australia, Canada, South Africa, um, Mali, Mauritania, China, Bali, and but some destinations you can't uh, go to anymore because of um, yes, because of violence. Yes, and some have changed a lot, like China. After yes, I've been there. But I will never miss all this traveling and meeting people and getting known to different countries without, without borders. And now we have the chance, or I still, I I'm using the chance about uh, social media and this chat possibilities to still stay in touch with many of my judo friends. Yes, and I have to celebrate something else. It's not only the 40, 40 years first worlds, it's the 30 years my last gold medal at the Europeans and 25 years of my uh, self-employment, yes. So I, I think I'm gonna, I gonna celebrate the whole year. And I do it in my uh, practice. I have a tombola for um, kids which are organ, organ transplanted because I'm in a group with um, different sports medalists in Germany which are um, do benefits like benefit golfing teams or something else or, or like my tombola um, where the money goes to the kids and her families who are organ transplanted. Yes, and I'm a, I'm, and I'm a member for Lion. Yeah, that's what I have to give back to the, yes, to the community. I think that's wow. it. Wow, that's lovely, Karen. And that's great that you give so much back and you sound so active as well. Well, you mentioned Australia there and we are lucky today to have uh, Kerry Daniels Katz from Australia joining us. So I'll now ask Carrie, uh, Kerry to tell us a bit about what she's been up to on the other side of the world. Welcome, Kerry. Hello, everybody. Um, I still remember the 1980 World Championships because for me, that was the first real introduction to major travel. Um, we had only really um, been in our local um, Oceania area to go to there. So it was amazing. And I think like Ingrid said, uh, Rusty met us at the airport and you know, the whole Australian team and we felt like so special. We felt like we were the, the really important team. Um, and it was amazing. And she made you just feel so comfortable. So it's just been really lovely to see judo grow um, within the world, especially for women. Um, I teach, I still run a judo club with my husband. I married a judo player and we run a very successful judo club in um, Sydney. Um, I am very lucky. I have uh, two boys that are 25 and 22 that love their judo and um, went to the Rio Olympics. So they um, want to do much further, uh, much more judo than I do. They travel everywhere in the world and they're uh, trying to qualify for Tokyo as well. Um, so it's fantastic. We've been able to make judo our, our whole family life. Um, I also, uh, judo is a volunteer sport for us in um, Australia, but I teach uh, special needs children. So I teach children with autism. Um, that's my uh, full-time job. And I do teach PE to those children. And it's just wonderful. It's um, amazing to be able to give something back to children and to people that want to learn. Uh, our judo club, we just love coaching the children and they aspire. We have a very, a lot of women, a lot of girl judo players. And I think that is because we have uh, a lot of female coaches on the mat. So they can have so, some role models there. Um, yeah, and yeah, and now I guess I'm living, we travel a lot with our children to our boys to go and watch them compete. We're quite lucky we um, have that opportunity. Um, now with COVID, everything's a little bit different and, but we hope that, you know, we might be able to still get to Tokyo to, um, to see them. But yeah, that's our life. We're just lucky that uh, they love their judo as much as I guess I did at the time and have been able to keep going. So that's all from Australia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kerry. And it's great to hear that you've got a lot of girls and women in the club and also a lot of women coaches. I think that's really important and it's an area that we want to progress is to get more women into coaching and um, thank you very much so I'd like to ask um, a lady who I've known for 40 years um, to share with us what she's been doing Loretta could you unmute and share a little bit about your story 
Well, good morning, everyone, and what a delight it is to be here. So excited sitting and listening to all these stories. Well, from 1980, um, I was 17 years of age, and um, it was an absolute, an exciting time, very young. And um, for me, it was a bit of a whirlwind because not really expecting to, to win a bronze medal on that day um, was a surprise to everyone, but it was a, a life changing um, journey for me. And I've continued to stay in judo for 49 years and um, which has been an absolute blessing for me. Um, carried on as an international athlete two years after the first world championships to go on and win the world championships, but drop in a weight category in the under 52 kilos. And that was held in Paris. And from there, I had an international career right up until 1992, which then I retired to have two, well, I was married and with two children then, Jade and Scott. And um, Scott has decided to follow in his footsteps of his mother and his father. And he's an international athlete now himself in the under 81 kilo category and hopefully going to make the, the Commonwealth Games in 2022. After retiring, um, I went on to national coaching where I worked um, at, with the, the national cadet squad and the junior um, national squad for, for girls. And, and Lisa will know very well the stories we've had for many years as Lisa assisted us within that squad, looking after those young ladies and um, giving them the guidelines and um, the, the moral codes, as we would say, for a very young group of young athletes, over about 100 that we, we worked with on a regular basis. And uh, that went on for 12 years. It was as long as well as working as a national squad, I also set up a program in schools um, where we were teaching children as an after school activity. And um, again, in introducing them to sport, physical activity, health, well being, and to also um, to build up friendship and a, a base of judo in, a, in the fundamental side of judo, which was very successful and continues to this day. But obviously, workload. Um, I moved on and um, within the coaching side and then happened to just fall in to working with um, the uh, international, the European Judo Union first and then into the International Judo Federation as part of the commentary team for the IGF where I was, I, I just love it. The, the, for me, it's like having the best seat in the house when you're watching these international athletes competing on a regular basis. It's very exciting. And it's something that I was looking, realize how difficult, for me, co commentating in that sort of time is always something because it comes from the heart, because I know and I feel what these athletes are going through. And it's not always so easy. And, and sometimes others can be quite judgmental on the performance themselves, but we can't always perform to our best ability. So for me, it's an absolute delight to be able to, to bring through that the, the sort of physical presence of these athletes competing on a regular basis. So within that time, I'm now also a director of the British Judo Association, have been for eight years. And um, it, that's been challenging because it, for, for me, the sports side is the exciting and it's the passion that I love within the sport. But being a director, it's the politics that also goes with it. And that can be quite challenging, especially for me. And, um, and I've just embarked on, um, I've, I've had experience over the time of working with Lisa and part of her team when she was the, the team manager for the, um, the, the Olympic Games in London 2012. And I was um, the athlete service manager at that time and then went on to two years after that to work with Simone Callender for the Commonwealth Games as a technical operations manager within the, that um, event, multi-sport environment. And now I've just been appointed as the, the Commonwealth Games um, sports manager for wrestling and judo in the next Commonwealth Games, which will be in 2022. And I start that position 
um, next year in March. So it's been a very exciting year, a couple of years. Well, I say a couple of years, 40 years. And um, I'm just proud to say that I'm still very much in love with the sport and the people that are around that sport and, and um, wouldn't change a thing in the, in the direction that I've gone throughout those 40 years. Thank you very much, Loretta. And we've shared so many tears and laughs over the last 40 years. And we all want to wish you good luck with your, your new role that you're starting in 2021. Thank we'll you. now jump across to Italy and we'll ask Cristina Fiorentini to share her story. Welcome, Cristina. Hello, hello to everybody. And thanks for inviting me to this meeting. Thanks to Lisa, thanks to Elisabetta and Jean and Kerry. I'm very happy to be here. Well, I was 17 when I arrived in New York for competing for Italy in under 72 kilograms. And I remember very well when we arrived in this big hotel uh, in front of the Madison Square Garden, and we met um, Rusty for the first time. And um, I have also a funny story about, about the, that moment, but I tell you maybe later. <laughs> so I didn't win the medal in the World Championship. I lost uh, the um, I lost the final for the bronze medal, and this is my big uh, regret because. Uh, I, I broke my, my knee during this fight. So um, I will never know, maybe I could win, maybe not, but uh, I, just big, I had this problem with the knee. And I remember very well how difficult it was to walk around the city, to walk around the New York City with my big leg, because we wanted, after the competition, we wanted to <clears throat> go around a little bit. And for me, I couldn't walk. And also, um, I didn't see a doctor. I didn't see an hospital. I didn't see anything. But because before, you know, it was like this. I mean, we didn't have anything. We were happy. We didn't have anything. We had our coach. Probably everybody remember. He's, um, our coach is a maestro Alfredo Monti. Hope he's watching us in this moment. It uh, was everything for us. He was our, our um, coach, our father, our uh, doctor, our um, psychoanalyst, our dietology. He did everything for us. And uh, we thanks him very much for what he did. And um, we love him uh, very much. And so um, after that, I compete until uh, 1988. And then when I could not go to the Olympic, um, I stopped. A lot of us couldn't go to the Olympics in 1988. So I stopped to compete and I became a physical educator. And I opened my own gym, my own judo club in Milano. And I think I've been very lucky because uh, I, had, I worked very well for 25 years. I had my club, I, was, I had a lot of kids, and I worked very, very, very well. And uh, then uh, when my daughter, I have a daughter, she's 26 years old, when she went uh, to UK for university to study, for studying, I decided to take a break. And uh, I go live in Sardinia. Do you know Sardinia, our beautiful island? And um, I continue working judo, but uh, doing uh, different things. Work a little with the Italian uh, Federation. I am uh, president of a commission about school and uh, promotion. And we do a lot of projects. And also I have uh, my own um, project of uh, self-defense. The name is Defesa in Rosa. And uh, I work a lot with public administration. We organize classes for uh, women for um, self-defense. I mean, um, to do a little bit uh, of self-defense for women. They don't do anything. Uh, they don't, women, they, they don't practice our sport. And um, now I'm back to Milano because I'm from Milano. I mean, I, I would like now to live half in Sardinia, half in Milano. And I have a new project a little school 
of uh, martial arts and judo just for uh, women and kids. I don't want men around, just women and kids. <laughs> so now this is my new, my new project. So what I think about New York, I think that was a very important moment because before New York, nobody cares about us. After New York, we start talking about the Olympics and everything changed. And if you ask me what judo gave to me, I think judo gave me everything because uh, when, I was, uh, when I was young, I had the chance to go around the world and uh, before it was not so easy to go around the world. For us, it was a very special thing. After that, uh, judo gave me a job because I'm a judo teacher and the only thing I know how to do is judo and I work in judo. But the most important thing are friends that judo gave to me. Friends from, okay, now I don't wanna cry. <laughs> friends from all over the world because when, uh, COVID-19 arrived from China. Italy was the first country. And uh, the first, first country arrived, COVID arrived here. And I'm from Milano. And uh, I, I lost friends, a lot of relatives. But I have a lot of friends from all over the world that write me, uh, call me, send mail. And uh, for me, it was, was very, very, very important. I talk a lot with Jean. I remember Karen Kruger sent me a mask because we didn't have mask at the moment in Italy. So for me, I realize how much important friends forever. So thanks again for this chance you give to me and um, stay safe and see you soon. Thank you very much, Christina. That was, that was lovely and uh... Yeah, it's nice when, when judo family come together and support each other in, in these difficult times. And I'm sure it was really nice to get masks from Karen. I'm sure you really appreciated that. And also we have many memories of Sardinia. Loretta and I, we went there many times together to the competition there. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. So last but not least, I'm going to ask a lady with whom I've also had many, many laughs uh, over the years on the IJF World Judo Tour. Marlene, can you share with us what you've been up to in the last 40 years? Morning, everybody. Hello, how are you? Everybody okay? With nice stories I hear. And I have uh, a very uh, membering of New York. But uh, I will first want to, uh, to thank you everybody who organized this uh, this organization for the for the, the memories of new york so lisa elisabetta uh, everybody jean and my member from uh, rusty Kadagobi is a long time ago before new york i told yesterday when we have a rehearsal i told you about uh, rusty because she was a referee on my tatami on the british open and they're standing a, a big women woman with uh, Great uh, allure, allure. I thought maybe in English it's difficult, but she's standing there and there was an opponent of me and she take my breast and turn it. And then Rusty stopped the, the, the match and she told uh, my opponent, you get a punishment because you thrust my breast uh, is turned on. So it was the first uh, punishment I, <laughs> I get from uh, Rusty. A, a total new. It was great. It was great. And also in New York, when we came there, she was like a <laughs> judo mother. And I learned about a lot of, of that because I think that's so important to be uh, a warm person uh, for everybody. Uh, New York was for me so very important in my life because I was 17 years old and I came there and I'm I, must, I have to fight in Madison Square Garden. It was so great to do that. It was so big to, to stay there. And also, uh, yeah, the, the, the signature we put on for the Olympic Games was a start for the women's judo. So very important. I was a fighter also for judo women's because I get in uh, 1997, I became, become the women's coach of the Netherlands. And I stayed there for 18 and a half years. And I, I saw the last years 
that the men coaches after New York see the women's judo more important than before. And that, that was a great, great opportunity to, uh, to bring the ju women's judo at a level. And if you see now, what's the level now with the women's judo is great because I saw the, the, the videos from years ago and you see the videos now, technical, uh, mentally, it was a big step. So in the 40 years, the women's judo is very, very, uh, gets, gets up in, in, in every, every level. It's great to see that. Um, in the years I was a judoka, uh, I was 17 years, I was starting in New York, but before I did British Open, I think by the most people I hear, they were 15 or maybe younger, to get into in international judo uh, tournaments. But New York was the start of everything. After that, I did some world championships, European championships, and uh, I meet a lot of people there, friends, and that's what the rest saying is most important because now also you see the people and you have uh, a click with them. It's nice to see. After my judo career, I uh, start my own sports center and I did that for 40, 40, uh, 35 years with my sister, Joyce. And uh, uh, anderhalf, anderhalf year ago, we sold the, 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 the sports center. So I started at a new uh, adventure. I don't know how, but I started with it. And uh, I looking back at a, a very good um, judo career, who brought me so many things because you are mentally strong. Uh, you can all the... You can put all the problems. I think it's it's for me, it's, it's my life. Judo bring me so much in every way. So I think that that's the most important uh, thing in, the, in judo. So that's why I also said the problems are now with COVID. We have to take everybody a judo suit on and we can bring them some mentally uh, skills. So that's from Holland, uh, Lisa. Thank you very much, Marlene, and it's really nice to hear about your experiences. And uh, we did work well together for a long, long time, and it's it's lovely to see you again. And um, so, what we're going to do now that everybody's introduced themselves is I'm going to pass to Nicola and Elisabetta, and they're going to start the question and answering session. So, over to you, Nico. Sorry, I needed to unmute myself. <laughs> I was so into, I mean, listening to your answers and your presentation that it was, I mean, uh, I had to refocus on what I had to, I have to do now. Uh, so, I mean, we're waiting for Elisabetta to be able to be back. Uh, we hope soon because she had a, a small issue with, uh, with her computer. But anyway, we've already received some some questions and feedback from, uh, from our I mean, spectators and the people watching uh, the webinar, which is really cool. And uh, I will start with one of those questions that we, we got. It is, if you could go backwards in time to 1980, what would you do differently or change? I think it's an interesting question because all of you, you, you mentioned during the, your presentation that you were 17, 18, 19 years old. So what would you change if you would go back uh, in time? Uh, maybe we can start with uh, Karen Kruger from Germany. So what would you change if you would have to go back to 1980? One thing, okay, for, for judo, I would change my training a little bit because, yes, we trained um, until the last day before the competition. And for me, it hasn't been good. I know that I have, when I feel like a break, I have to take a break. And, you know, that's for, that from judo. So not until the last day. You're self-confident enough to know when, that you're good enough. Yes, to compete and give your body a little rest. That's for me. But other things, I don't. I don't know if I would change anything because uh, New York was a great uh, experience. Um, I have been in America before in Chicago. So New York is bigger than Chicago. But um, to compete in the Madison Square Garden, I wouldn't change anything of it because I watched with my grandmother on television. Those fights from Cassius Clay, Alias Muhammad Ali, who took place 
in Madison Square Garden. Yes, and that was a great experience to fight there and to meet all those nice people and judo people. I wouldn't change anything and I wouldn't, cha uh, wouldn't change with uh, judoka right now because I think we have been a group with the same, um, with the same goal. We wanted, to go, we wanted to have an Olympics and everyone paid for it. I paid to pay for myself for well, a big part of this uh, journey. Yeah, We paid by ourselves and didn't get paid for it. Now it's more professionalism, full-time training. And yes, maybe, I don't know if it's different motivation, but it's pro benefit and more individual. And um, I did the best when I had a normal life or, or my family around or, yeah. So like after the, af directly after 70, no, directly after this um, world championships, I had an exam for uh, insurance clerk after 90 winning the gold medal at the Europeans. I had my exam for physiotherapy. And so I still worked and trained as much as I could. And I won't miss this, but because it's like um, living a normal life but having something special as a hobby. Thank you very much. And uh, I would ask this, the, the same question actually to Kerry, and then we will have a small first surprise for all of you. So Kerry, what would you change? I mean, if you had to go back in time in 1980? Um, I think I was 19 when I went to New York, but I thought I trained really hard in Australia. And I did, but it was nothing to what I was exposed to when I went overseas and saw the level of the rest of the world. In Australia, we were a long way away and we didn't travel a lot. And I think we, we were in a bubble. And what we thought was doing the best was the best we could do. But when we were exposed to the World Championships, it was another level. We had to change. And that was the best thing about myself, my own growth, how I grew as a person. And then I can then use that as, um, as a great teaching method for, for other girls in particular, to know what we went through. Again, we paid for everything. Um, uh, we had you know, only the competition we had, like our Oceania region was only you know, two, three countries. So we had very little exposure to the rest. But New York, I wouldn't change anything about that. When Karen mentioned she watched um, Muhammad Ali um, on boxing matches, we were lucky enough when we left New York, we met Muhammad Ali at the airport. We went from New York to Florida. Our coach was American at the time and he was at the airport. And we have a photo of ourselves with Muhammad Ali. And that was just amazing. My children just go, really, you met him? And it's like, yes, you know. So from New York, I wouldn't change anything. It was the beginning of the whole uh, evolving of judo for me yeah in australia thank you very much Harry. and everybody i mean every one of you are talking about the beginning in new york and so on so let's start with the first small video that we prepared and we'll have several ones uh, during the the session so matthias if you're ready to launch the the first film uh, Belgium got their gold. Ingrid Bergman overcome with emotion and winning the gold medal. Oh, gold medal, unbelievable. This is the biggest upset. I think everyone from France has their mouth open. No one expected this one. No one. All that for yeah, France the loser and the winner is Ingrid Bergman. So Belgium is the match. So. Ingrid, how, would, how do you react? I mean, watching those images, I, I guess you have seen them already, but I mean... I, I've, I saw them a few times, but uh, it was really special because um, uh, Paulette was really the strongest at that time. She was 30, I was 19, I was beginning and she was ending. It was her last world championships and me, I was at the beginning of my career. And uh, she came that year into Belgium to, to make a training session as a, as a teacher. And she was training with me because we were gonna go to, there was some world championships and she had this uh, movement was Uchimata and it didn't work. The whole, the whole session we had like two, I think she stayed the whole day and uh, 
when we were training in Brussels once a week, we were training two hours in the morning and two hours in the afternoon. And she was always trying with me and her movement didn't, didn't work with me. And I met her at the competition, I think it was in Udine at the Europeans. The movement didn't work. So when we came in the final at the World Championships, I was expecting the same movement, of course, because it was a speciality. But when we get on the mat, she did completely something different. That's because here we only see the last movement she did. But she was attacking Osotogari, who was a completely different uh, direction. And I, she, she almost got me at like, she attacked, I think it was like 10 seconds or 15 seconds because she did it. And I was on the toes of my, really standing on my toes and almost get over it. And I go, I didn't expect it. But like 20 seconds later, she tried the same movement. And I thought, no, no, you can do twice because she's like uh, making a phone call. And I said, no way she's gonna do it three times. But if she does it the, the, the next time, she will fly. And she telephoned, she did the third time the same movement and I took over and I won the, the world championship. So I can still remember the match because she was much, much stronger, but she was so concentrated and she knew she was not, she could not work, not do her uh, speciality. And uh, she, I, she was very, very angry because she had the, the, the day before she had a silver medal. She got two silvers. She deserved a, a, a gold, but like only one can get the gold medal. But she said she, uh, she felt better afterwards because she said afterwards she got so many medals. So I won against her, somebody who started her career. So <laughs> she was not angry anymore. Thank you very much. And then that gave us also the, the opportunity like we did yesterday to, to pay tribute to Paulette uh, yes. some, some a few years ago. Uh, but uh, she's in uh, everybody's uh, thoughts, and uh, it's, a, it's a nice moment also to remember those who passed away in, in those 40 years. Yeah. Uh, I mean, as we are with you, Ingrid, we have one question from Janine who asks, Ingrid, do you remember what problem Rusty had when you won the title? I don't know if that rings a bell or... That's she a had, when, I won, when I won the medal, no. Okay. Did she tell us? Maybe I remember if she tells us. I don't know. I mean, Janine put that question, so maybe she can add some more, I mean, elements so we can really understand the question. But I, I mean, we just had that, that question popping up right now. I don't know if- For your I... teammate. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, uh, Ellie, if you want to ask something, or are you back? Welcome back. I'm back. Yes, sorry, some uh, troubles with the technology. As much as you try. <laughs> The technology does the best for you in the wrong moment. Uh, so just back, I will join later with some more questions to you. Go on, Nicola. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just answering to Janine so we can maybe have some more information. Um, um, maybe, I mean, uh, if uh, Matthias is ready, we can, I mean, uh, watch hey, hey. The, the, second, the second video. And then I will explain a little bit because, I mean, uh, we were supposed to have someone else with us today and she's, she cannot join, but I will explain after we watch the video. Okay, so I mean, uh, first of all, um, so I, I need to, I mean, to, uh, to send you all the best regards from Jocelyn Triadou. Um, we had a, a really nice interview like two or three weeks ago that was published on the IGF website. Uh, but then today she cannot make it. She, I mean, she promised she would try, but she had a knee operation 
less than a week ago, uh, a new replacement. So everything is fine, but uh, she, it's a little bit painful. And this morning she sent me a message. She was really so sorry that she couldn't join, but she says hello to everyone. And, uh, and we had prepared that, 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 small, that small film. And maybe I will ask Jean to react towards that because that's something that uh, Jocelyn was mentioning during her interview, that there was some kind of small issues with the, the, the anthem. Um, it's not here, I mean, we're not here to blame anyone. We know that 40 years ago was sometimes a little bit difficult and complicated, but maybe Jean, you can, you can react a bit and explain what happened. Yes, not so, only 40 years ago, even now. Yeah, even and now. The funny, <laughs> and the funny thing was the the announcer and Rusty take, uh, talking along during the video because the video is much longer. So, I, ah, but we should sing. Yeah, actually, that's what Jenny now says. The national song and flag was the problem. And Rusty asked our team leader if we, we brought it with us because we didn't find, she didn't find it. I, I can elaborate a little bit on that. As as I mentioned, uh, the volunteers uh, there was there were no true professionals that organized events and, and did this regularly. So uh, this event was put together by uh, volunteers from our dojo, local judo clubs, and, and everybody that Rusty could recruit in the area. And the person she put in charge, one of her students, and, and this is actually annotated in the book because it really just stayed with Rusty. Uh, she sent him to do one job, which was to go and get the cassette tapes of every nation uh, national anthem. So. Uh, they were all on cassettes, on little audio cassettes, and each audio cassette was supposed to be in alphabetical order and represent every country and have the corresponding flag in order as well, because whomever won, it would just be selected. Well, he messed up. He got everything mislabeled. He got everything backwards. And uh, he grabbed a flag that was not the Belgium flag. He grabbed some other flag and, and started putting in the wrong tape. And if you can hear Rusty in her, in her very exhausted Brooklyn accent saying, uh, we'll sing, what the heck is he doing? So, you know, she, she was ticked off. But uh, I think they finally figured something out. But it, it was the uh, Belgium anthem, the French anthem. And um, I think for years on end, uh, every time the French wrote something about judo, they always put that the first women's world championships messed up on the national anthem. I mean, it was just so funny because Rusty took it in stride as anything that can go wrong behind the scenes would go wrong. Uh, there, there's so many stories from behind the scenes, but as far as the anthems, everything got mixed up because uh, the person who had one job who was in charge just messed it all up. Uh, I'm surprised Rusty didn't strangle him. Actually, Jocelyn also explained to me that she had two awarding ceremonies because this, the first one didn't work out. So they, they were called back to go back on the podium to have a second awarding ceremony. And she felt actually she was, she, she told me that she was so happy because she was world champion, but she was also so sad because Barbara Klassen was the second and had to go for a second time on the podium. And, and we can also, I mean, remember Barbara Klassen. And, um, and, uh, but that, that was a, an emotional moment when I, when I interviewed Jocelyn about that because she, I mean, she was happy and sad at the same time. Um, uh, Ellie, do you want to, do you have a question or do you want to go on on something before we move on uh, to the next video? Oh, we can go to the next video and then uh, continue. Yeah, so let's, let's go for the, the, the third bit of uh, small souvenirs and memorabilia that we've got from the, these World Championships. <laughs> It's funny actually because we hear a lot of background noises and voices and and say what's wrong, what's going on, and and, and at the end it was an amazing event. But it's funny to uh, to to hear all those comments in the back. And um, it was nice to have you both here, one next to the other again. So, Marjolaine, what do you think about the fight? It's terrible to see it in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't, 
I, I wasn't happy that Ingrid fights first in the in the plus category in the over 72 because I always love of Ingrid. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> but it's uh, it's nice to see the because there are not so many videos uh, of my competitions. Uh, Anita uh, stops uh, the last days uh, found via William Maxi Maxi uh, from videos. So that's uh, what I see is for me, uh, uh, yeah, very <laughs> good to see. But there's, there is a video against Ingrid. Ingrid, it was a terrible fight to you. Every time you fight to each other. <laughs> I always lost of you. <laughs> and Ingrid, what's your point of view on Marjorie? <laughs> I can't remember this fight, but it's true. We fought, we fought a, a few times and, and well, we we still we're still friends, aren't we? <laughs> she was she's not angry anymore. Well, it's it was it, we're all a big family. It's so funny because we didn't see for each other for how long, Marjolin? It's like we met yesterday. I mean, uh, yes, yes, yes. Something different with judo. We we can talk uh, twenty years after. I I went to see uh, I went to New York with my son. When he was 21 to to visit uh, new york so i thought and i showed him Madison square garden and i i said on facebook uh, on eve who was uh, who lives in new york i haven't haven't seen her for 25 years or something and she wrote to me oh come to my house and he said to me uh, when we arrive how do you recognize her i said i don't know how long didn't you see her about 25 years no picture nothing else and we met each other and like we spent the whole night and he said, I go to sleep because we were talking all night and it's like we saw each other uh, the day before. And that's the same thing now. So if you see the matches and when you talk to it, that's so funny. It's so, it's such a pretty, we can't meet. I mean, girls, we have to meet each other once in, in New York and, and, and do this over. You that make, I, that's you make a nice project. I mean, bring all you girls back to New York and then having like maybe a, uh, um, to redo the competition or something, or I mean, like in a different way, but I mean, <laughs> no, maybe no. a training together would be easier. I think with all the knee replacements and uh, the, the pulse replacements, and I think then we have to make a special, uh, special category. <laughs> What's like the replacement, too? <laughs> My son is doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, yeah. And he Somebody on the ground, they pull each other on the ground to stay on the ground. Uh, it's safer. We can do that. <laughs> yes, but when I come on the ground, I can't go up because I have two re knee replacements. So, <laughs> but then we have. We a will help you. <laughs> we we have a project for the for the next years. Okay. Yeah, and uh, as for the videos, we have, as we said yesterday, to to thank the Kanokogi family because it's thanks to them. Or thanks to Daddy that forgot them in the in the in the basement, <laughs> that we can now have them and uh, they will be available in our streaming in the next days. So you are gonna see much more than what you saw today, and uh, what's in the thing. So nice. uh, keep an eye on uh, our website and on our YouTube uh, channel. And you will find all what we could recover from uh, from the event. It's it's I saw them all, and it's quite funny because <laughs> there are comments offline, and uh, the coaches sh screaming, and uh, the um, speaker and the TV commentator talking, and it's really really funny. <laughs> so uh, it will take some time, but I'll tell you it's worth seeing. And, and I, I can tell you, we have some comments now in the chat box and so on that, I mean, yes, I mean, that the, the idea of bringing all you together in New York one day, I, it's definitely a, one project that we, I mean, we'll, we need to think about. Uh, I have a question for, uh, for Loretta, uh, because we have already uh, gotten twice the, the, the question, but given your experience in life from first women's world championships until now, what would your best advice would be to the top female athletes now transitioning from being a competitor to the next stage in their lives? Well, I, I think it's a really important question and it's something that's always concerned me 
from my own personal experiences because as a young athlete coming through, it was all about judo. And I never thought about what a, my career was going to be. Education was always on the back step. And all I wanted to do was do judo and travel the world. And, and I was lucky enough to be able to do that. Um, as a national coach then, um, I found myself going through one stage and another in my career and being very fortunate to be able to have those opportunities. But there was cases that it could have gone all horribly wrong and, and not had the, the ideal opportunity that I would have wanted to have. So I think it's really so important for um, programs when you have you take on young athletes in a national system where they are competing for their country, that the governing bodies or the, the associations themselves think about the welfare of young athletes and give them this sort of pet talk and uh, an education pathway to be able to work alongside with a coaching career, uh, uh, with their judo competitive career into a professional career afterwards. And I think we have really a duty of care to athletes now because the pressures of these athletes are so extreme. And, and yes, there's a lot more opportunities now in, in for athletes to do so well within sport, whether it's commentary, whether it's coaching, whether it's physical activities, setting up their own gym, there is a lot. But what's so important is that we recognize that they are challenging times and they have to be thought out very clearly from the start when you take on an athlete to be able to give them the tools that um, will help them fulfill a career after, after their competitive career. And um, so as much as it is for the individual, I think it's for those, the coaches, the, the performance directors, the centers, that they take that, they take that on board as well as taking the athletes to, through a competitive career. They have to have um, that feeling of what they're going to do afterwards and support them after the medals. And I think that's very important for every country. Thank you, Loretta. And actually, I mean, I, I need to ask that. We have a question for Joe from Joe Crawley. I mean, she's working with the IGF Media Department as well, but she's asking between all you, the panelists, how many new bionic joints do you have, hips and knees? I think more new ones than originals. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have two hip replacements. Um, over the years and I have a pin in my shoulder so as my children you would used to say when they were younger I'm the bionic woman and um, but I wish I could be as strong and as physical as that bionic woman right now but I do feel the cold a lot more in those days we we didn't have the resources um, as far as the medical support and physiotherapy. And um, we, we always went with a very small team and we had to generally look after ourselves. And if we got injured, we just strapped it up and got on with things. And now there is a lot more research and more support for athletes to be in top pr prime position and in good physical health to be able to continue a, a career for many, many years. But in my day, it was just, you, you just, got on with it, strapped it, on, strapped it up and, um, and dealt with it afterwards, put an ice bag on it. But it's, it's taken its toll. Um, Christina, I have a question for you, which is a little bit linked to the one I asked to Loretta before, but it's more like, what would you like to say to a younger, younger female judoka today uh, who wants to be involved, who wants to compete? What would you say to that young judoka, female judoka today, based on your experience? Well, I think everything is different now, so it's difficult to talk to young people. And um, maybe the sport or the judo is a mirror of our society. And um, I think uh, that we, we have been the last generation, the last romantic generation. After us, everything changed. Everything became a business. Everything uh, became uh, like, uh, you know, there are the social media. And uh, so now the, younger, the young people care a lot about how to, how to show, you know, how to look like. But they don't work very much about the, um, the important things. So 
what I try to say to my students or to the young people and maybe don't care very much about uh, what people say or what you look like, but you have to, to work, to work a lot because uh, all, the, all the champions that are here, all the people that we know is people that work very, very, very much, especially at, at our time, we didn't have uh, the, 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 the know-how, we didn't know how to do things. So we're just training a lot, a lot of our randori, randori, run, randori, but maybe it was not so, so specific like they know how to do now. So I think that what the young people doesn't have in this moment is the, um, come si dice Elisabetta Costanza, la tenacia, Tightness to the strength to, to go to resist to resist the resilience actually the resilience maybe that that's what I think uh, young uh, people needs in this moment woman and men but maybe more woman because for us everything is more difficult especially in a sport like like judo especially teach judo for women is a little bit difficult because uh, if a big, uh, big, if a man say something, I mean, a sensei, a teacher, a judo teacher, a man judo teacher say something on the tatami, everybody believe. But if a woman say something, have to show. We have to show what we say or, we, or nobody trust us. That's what I find on my job in this, uh, 30 years that I teach, when I say something, I have to show. Then I, they believe me. But if I don't show, uh, well, maybe it's not true. That's why for us it's more difficult, I think. Uh, what do the other ladies think about this subject of uh, being more trustable than their colleagues, their male colleagues? I think we had to fight harder of course, but that made us who we are now. So every bad thing has a good thing. So I would never be the person because we had to show everything much, much further. We went to training. My first training session in Japan, I spent three days for two hours and a half bowing and nobody would fight with me because they wanted to send me on the, on the judo mat with the women. But I, I, get, I stayed and I, and I worked. I stayed and I, they were looking like for two hours and a half, three days, until Robert Van der Waller, another judo player, a man, came and he made us train. But everything we get always, all the girls I know here, we went until what we wanted to. We didn't give up. We trained much harder than everybody. And maybe it was not the right way, but it was only 100%. Never like they say now we do 70%, 60%, 50%. We didn't know that. But that made us who we, who we were, who we are now. So no regret. We, we have actually a really nice and interesting question as well from one of our, our refugee athletes from Nigeria, uh, Nigeria, I guess. So she's part of the refugee uh, IGF team and she's asking, and it's, that question is for all of you. So who wants to answer is up to you. But as a female athlete, I always had the problem of living up to the society's expectation and expectation of my sport acquaintances. From one hand, society expected me to be feminine, feminine in the way that they define. And from the other hand, on the other hand, in the gym, I was expected to step over my femininity. I wanted to know if you had the same experience. If yes, how did you cope with it? So once again, uh, put that in, in, in the framework that she's one of the refugee athletes. I mean, I mean, yeah, she's the, the world circuit right now. And she's from Afghanistan. Afghanistan, yeah. So who wants to answer to that question? Yes, I, I would ask if I was uh, to answer because it's an other culture, I think, and that's a pity because I think uh, we have to stay where we are and who we are. Uh, I think we are all um, fighting to that and I think she has to go on to, to, uh, to stay by herself. And I think it's very difficult uh, because in that culture is maybe everything d d uh, different. So fight for it and stay mm -hmm. with for yourself. 
Yeah. I, I think, I mean, she's from Afghanistan, but as she's a ref in the refugee team, she's living uh, in one of our countries. Okay, yes. okay, okay. Uh, she has to be herself. She has to be herself. Loretta, want, do you want to react to, to that? Yes, I, I think it, it is just a, a cultural thing in, and we sometimes we find it very difficult to change that culture of what people perceive women to be within that country. But I think the most important thing is to not lose sight of what you truly want and to, to try and dig in and fight for that. And we can personally do that. And it's so important. We're in a fighting sport. And it, that's what attracts us to it, is the, the ability to get up there and fight for what we want. But how was um, 40 years ago for you? 40 years? I, I must admit, I, maybe I was just blessed. I, I, I felt as a young athlete, um, yes, there wasn't many um, boys, um, there wasn't many girls in my judo club. But and the national team was all women and there was plenty of women and being a lightweight made it so much easier to be able to train at that level. Obviously, you see the hurdles as far as um, heavier weight women needing the stronger opponents. And if they're in countries that there is fewer women competing, then that makes the, a bigger struggle for them. But I, I must admit that although there was a quite a lot of men and it was more of a dominant sport by men, I was completely encouraged and supported by a lot of male competitors through my young career. And, um, but, and, and I didn't find, I, I wasn't looking for the hurdles. I was just looking for the light at the end of the tunnel. So for me, it wasn't something that I was trying to put an obstacle in my way. It was just saying, right, which route do I take? Which is the quickest route? Which is the more direct? And get through. It, it's like going from A to B to C. It was, it maybe took a little bit longer, but it was challenging. And I love the challenge. And for me, that was really important. Something to get started with. Yes, I, it, I think about it because I, in uh, 1979 I became the national uh, national coach and then I come uh, in the international uh, zone and then you see uh, everybody or the most people are coaches are men. But uh, it was not a struggle because they ac accepted me because I think I do what I have to do and I, I fight for it for my position. It was not a problem. So... Uh, that's why I say stay by yourself and do what you have to do. And Carrie, yeah. what, uh, uh, what was the situation in, uh, in Oceania? I mean, it's, we are talking from, uh, all, from, from European side. How was the down there? Um, when, I, when I was... Uh, a junior, I had no, there were no girls around, it, uh, no co female coaches. It was all men, but they were all very supportive of um, pushing the women along. So most of our training partners were boys. And it wasn't really until, I guess, during my career. And then when I, I retired after um, the Seoul Olympics that I think people gave me more credibility um, as a female to want to go in because then I went into national coaching and as seniors and then into cadets and juniors. But that took a lot, a lot for people to, I think um, it was said before, the credibility a man would, the, a male sensei would say something and it was just done. And the female, it was like, I had to show that that was, I had to prove that that was the way to go. But I think um, that has changed a lot now. We have had some very successful um women in Australia that have done well. We now have the uh, head of our performance team is um, Maria Peckley, uh, a female so from Hungary. So that has helped, I think, change the perspective from a lot of people now, believing that uh, women can go and coach and you can believe what, what they are saying and doing. But we have a lot more female coaches now and I think that um, is helping. And it, but it has taken time, time for that to happen. And, and, and Shine, who asked the question, is really happy with the answers. She just passed a message and she was happy with the answers. Uh, we have one last bit of video because we're coming close, I mean, step by step towards the end. We still have a few minutes, but we have one last bit of video. So if Matthias, you're ready to launch it.
The video is very, very short. I don't know if one of you could recognize herself, uh, but it was one of the, the, maybe the only video where we had a girl from Chinese Taipei. So one is one of you and the other one is a Chinese Taipei lady. We tried to have them in, uh, in the panel, but due to language, uh, and uh, time time zone difference troubles they could not attend. But we say hello to all our friends from Japan, China, Chinese Taipei, and uh, Hong Kong that took part in the event. Yeah, and in the upcoming days, we'll have a new article also on the website about Kaori from Japan, uh, who was the youngest athlete uh, at that World Championship. And uh, so we're going to publish an article in the upcoming days also on the website. So, Christina, you didn't recognize yourself? <laughs> that was Christina, by the way. <laughs> touch the video, yes, touch the video. <laughs> no, I'm not, I don't think it's me. Oh, yes, yes. Because I was, I was number six, I was 72. This is number five, no? No, it's oh, under six. 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 It must be under six. Long blonde hair, it was you. <laughs> oh, but then, I, will, I will watch again later. But... Yeah, don't worry, don't worry. It's, by the way, it's but Matthias can play something. it again. Matthias can play it again. Let me see. It's by far away, yeah? The six on the back, I think. Ah, yes, it's me. <laughs> yes, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I jump all around. <laughs> Oh, I, I didn't recognize myself. Thank you a lot for this present. Thank you very much. I can't believe. She was not jumping so much round. I remember her head behind my neck. <laughs> oh my God, I didn't recognize. It's incredible. But I also forgot about the, the match I, I did. I remember the last one because, I, because it was the final, but I didn't remember the others. You know, 40 years. <laughs> but, but as we said, you will find them all. <laughs> but I'm, I'm sure you can remember a lot, all of you, because when I started to do the interview for the website, the first answer that I always got from from you i mean as a group was oh i don't remember exactly what happened and then step by step minute after minute it would come back and all the memories would come back and then i, I remember when i interviewed marie paul panza from france she immediately told me i don't remember anything it was so long ago and then she could remember even if what she scored the first match the second match etc i mean she could remember every single bit of the competition yeah, so we, we must uh, meet each other often. <laughs> so we can, we can uh, make our life together. <laughs> Again. Thank you. Karen, do you remember, oh, do you remember your uh, uh, opponent? You talk to me? No, Karen. Uh, ah, sorry. Karen, do you remember yes. the, your opponent? Um, yes, my first opponent has been, it's Edith Simon, I think. And the, and the, the one in the repertoire, no, yes, the one in the repertoire was a Japanese girl. That's what I remember. And I, I don't know if it's someone else. I lost against Simon, I know. And the, the, first, the first opponent, I won against. You must. I, I, I don't know which country she was from. Uh, you will find everything on internet. Don't worry. Yeah, no, but I know yes. it was. Maybe <laughs> it was, it's been. Uh, no, it hasn't. Argentina, something like this. I don't know. Yes, the Argentina team was in all categories. They were. Yeah, uh, but a lot against Edith Simon. That's what I know. <laughs> but that's where you realize that that even was a world championship and was so important. When I was a competitor, I didn't go to the uh, World Championships, and I don't remember any single fight. 
But you, maybe in 40 years. Yeah, but you maybe you in went, 40 years with a long term. Yeah, but you went to the world championship, and because it was a world championship and it was a different event, you still have a lot in your mind and in your memory that come. I mean, when you're talking about that event, because it was so special, and that just to to tell that it was a special event, definitely. Uh, Loretta, I wanted to ask you because I mean we know each other and you're working with the IGF team regularly on the commentary and so on, and you're writing some articles for us as well. Um, I mean, when we had the rehearsal the other day, we were laughing uh, our heads off. When we, I mean, and uh, you, what funny do you remember? Something funny you remember about that event? Well, there were so many, so many. I, I think the British team were known for just laughing. Every time there was something, we found everything hysterical. And it was such a strong bond that we had with those seven girls. But one thing that kept him was very close in my mind was one of my matches, I think it was the second round, was against a young lady from Thailand. I think her name was Lamai. And um, uh, none of us had ever come across um, any of uh, Asian competitors before. And um, we, I was un unsure of what she was capable of doing, quite nervous about it. And um, halfway through the match, I had thrown her for a wazari and went into Niwaza, where I attempted to do the, a, a turnover of, into the Jujigatami. As I brought my leg under the, the head of my opponent, she then decided that she, she must have panicked or wasn't sure what was happening. But with fear, she bit into the back of my leg and um, which at that time I had laryngitis, so I couldn't even scream out a yelp. But I got up and I was limping and she actually drew blood through a judo suit. She had bruised the back of my knee and left her print. Now they always say with the Big Apple, you take a bite out of that, but I didn't expect to go to the, the Big Apple New York and get a bite out of my leg. But it was one of those situations that, no one understood what was going on. And I raised the, the, the trousers of my judogi to show what had happened, which obviously left a very clear print of her mouth in the back of my knee to then show the referee, to show the coach and Roy Inman at the time. And everyone was confused because I had laryngitis and I couldn't just say, look, she's just bitten me. And um, so it went round the, the whole mat showing my leg off for, for about... It felt like for minutes, but it was most probably only about 30 seconds. But it was a very bizarre situation and um, obviously never been repeated since. But that was one of my um, sort of funny moments that um, will always stay with us. And, and, and uh, inside the competition, what do you remember of New York? Because we had oh, that question also earlier. What do you remember of the city, of the Big Apple? Oh, <laughs> The big, the, well, the one thing that was always stayed in my mind is going to Macy's um, department store to actually see the Christmas tree that talked. <laughs> and I love that. 17 years of age, and I had like the oldest of five in our family that all gave me a list of what they wanted for Christmas. And we were going to go across for a little shopping trip. But between myself and Heather Ford and a few others, Avril Malley and Wynne Bolton, who was an assistant, we all found out about this Christmas tree that could talk to us. And on a regular basis, we couldn't help but go there and, and listen to it. And there was a, what, the first time we went there, there was, there was three of us standing around waiting for it to talk to us until eventually said, well, I don't think it's working. Maybe they're not in. And the, the tree then decided to say, hello there, girlies. How are you doing today? And we were like in this broad American accent and we completely fell about. And we were there for ages talking to it. And um, Wynne Bolton decided that she was going to hold one of the branches of the tree, just stroke it gently. And the tree started to shake and going, oh, hold on there, girl. <laughs> we just thought it was hysterical. It was a funny moment. It was a very, for, for a 17 year old, it was just unbelievable. The biggest tree I'd ever seen. And I also saw the, the real Santa Claus as well, which I just thought that was, it. everything got, went big in America. And for me, it's most probably one of the, the most exciting and one of the best cities I have ever traveled in my life.
and it gives me such fond memories and it's always a place that I, I love to go back. I've been to New York about five times now and I just love it every time. I've taken my children there to see the talking Christmas tree and to also see the real Santa. Ingrid, what do you remember beside the competition itself from the city, from, from New York? Oof. From New York, I remember we did some sightseeing and everything, like, like Loretta said, everything was big. And we stayed for a few days longer after the competition and it was so unreal. I mean, uh, for, for a young girl, I was 19 and, and never saw something else. I never traveled. I had to take the plane for the first time, came in the city, who lived 24 hours, 24, 24 hours, and never, New York never sleeps, what they say, but it's true. So oh, I have not really special. I remember when I get out of Madison Square Garden, where I had this uh, doping control and where we had this big beer, but even that, you know, but we couldn't go to the toilet and I was with somebody from, uh, uh, from uh, America. I forgot her name now. Um, the tall one, the black one. Team. Margie. Margie Castro. Margie. Margie. And we were laughing and, and we were drinking, but we couldn't. And they, they brought us a beer, but the beer was not normal. It was big beer. And that's what we had on the doping control. And when we get out, I felt so small. And that's when I thought, well, I'm a world champion, but nobody cares. And now, what? The world doesn't change. So I have to be uh, humble and I'm still like somebody else, you know, and it's not because I'm the world champion. I always remember this phrase during my whole career. And that's maybe why I stayed, uh, I didn't get um, high on my head and I thought I was the best. And I always said, you know, I'm, I try to be humble and do better and better and better. Thank you. Ellie, do you want to add a question? But then we will give the floor to Lisa. I, uh, the same question to, to Christina, how, how was your trip there with, uh, with the wool team? Because it was, was incredible. It was a big, big, uh, a big group. Okay. And now, now I try <laughs> to tell you a funny story. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know if I can translate in a good Go way. <laughs> you know, translate a funny story is very difficult. But uh, we have this joke still now after 40 years when we see our coach, Coach Monty, because um, when we arrive in this big hotel in, um, in New York, uh, we met Rusty. Uh, Rusty asked us when we want to training the day after. So now, Maestro Monti, he speaks a special language, the language from Roma. It is not really Italian, it's language from Roma. And in the language of, from Roma, uh, to say at three o'clock, you say, ai tre. So we arrive in this big hotel, we talk to Rusty, okay, we, they give us the room, and then Rusty asks, okay, at what time do you want training tomorrow? And uh, Maestro Monti says, um, at what time, uh, okay, tomorrow, we train uh, tomorrow, I three. <laughs> <laughs> so he talk half Romano, half English with Rusty, and we laugh so much with Rusty too, and we still laugh, with Maestro Monti, with the, our coach, because it was so funny. Nobody of us speak English, it's just uh, half Italian, half English, but especially him, half Romano and half English. That was fun. Thanks. Thank you so, thank you so much. I think that we have come to the end of that, of that session. I uh, thank you so much uh, to all of you and I will, now give the floor to Lisa to, to conclude that session. Thank you very much, uh, ladies. Thank you very much, Nico. That was really, really, really interesting and really emotional for me to hear all your stories. You're all, you've all been absolutely wonderful. And this brings us to the end of a fascinating seminar. And I think we also want to mention we, we, were, we, were, we focused on women, but we also, there was a lot of men who supported us. 
and we want to acknowledge them as well. So we want to thank all of the panelists for sharing their stories and being a key part of the progressive women's judo and sport movement. This session has been recorded like yesterday's and it's available on our YouTube channel. So please share with those who were not able to join us today. And I want to finish by saying something to Rusty, our panelists and all the other women pioneers from all of us grateful women in judo today. You lit the torch and led the way. You taught us to be strong. And though the road ahead is tough, you showed us we belong. Happy anniversary, everybody. Thank you very much for watching and sending all the judo family a lot of love. And I look forward to seeing you all in 2021. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Ciao. Lots of love. See you Thank soon. You. Bye, bye. Bye. See everybody, everybody in New York. Thank you. For See you all in New York. Ciao, Jean. Ciao, everybody. Ciao, Thank everybody. Thank you, the translators, Marine, Sara, Monia. Thank you all very much, ladies. Thank, Thank you. you, guys. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, bye. Marlene. Bye. Hi everybody, I'm Frank Lieber, and welcome to Madison Square Garden's Felt Forum for a truly historic event in women's sports. The first World Women's Judo Championship. 27 nations on hand competing in eight different weight classifications, and working with me is Rusty Katakogi herself, a former coach of the U.S. women's team and an organizer of this event, and I know this is a proud and happy moment for you. It certainly is, and we're very delighted to have you here cover our event and it's a history being made the beginning of the advanced movement towards the olympics for women's judo